This is my pleasure today to uh, welcome Frédéric Casals at Google. Uh, Frédéric is a research director at Inoria in France. He's uh, the head of the Algorithms, Biology and Structure group. And today he will talk about modeling noisy data. Frédéric. <coughs> so thank you for the introduction and also for the opportunity to give this talk in this company which is driving innovation in an impressive number of directions. And so indeed I'll be talking about modeling da noisy data and in fact, so I'll be talking about some specific applications, but also I put the emphasis on some key ideas, I think, which underlie all this work. And in particular, I'll be well, talking, presenting two applications. One of them is reconstructing uh, data on non-manifold objects. Here, one is looking at two intersecting spheres, and we are not talking about a surface, but uh, the two spheres intersect into a circle arc, and one also wishes to reconstruct such a complex topology. And the second application I'll be discussing in some detail is about modeling fuzzy objects. And so here it's about molecules. So this is a so-called nuclear pore complex for which noisy data are known. And so one would like to figure out interesting properties of such systems. So this is the outline of my talk. So I'll be presenting some motivations. Then I'll give you some mathematical background. I'll be presenting the key ingredients of what we are doing. <coughs> And then I'll discuss in detail somehow the two applications, the reconstruction of these non-manifold surfaces. So in fact, the right way to phrase this is in terms of compact sets. Uh, and then I'll be discussing the application to modeling fuzzy shapes, molecules in particular. And then I'll conclude. <clears throat> OK, so the motivations first. So let me give you a brief overview of the three two or three applications. So one of them, as you know, is surface reconstruction or re model reconstruction in general. So as input, one is given a point cloud, right? So the simplest case is uh, when the points are located on the surface. And so then it's just about inferring the surface onto which the points have been sampled. And of course, in terms of reconstruction, one may wish to end up with a piecewise surface interpolating the points. And as you know, this is a ubiquitous problem, problem which is found in reverse engineering, medical imaging, geology, cultural heritage projects. And I'm sure that here too, uh, for example, for Street View, possibly whenever there are data which have been scanned, one needs to reconstruct a model. So here is an example. We have a point cloud which has been sampled on a mechanical part and eventually one wishes to reconstruct the part. And as you can see here, topologically speaking, this is in fact a torus with two holes. We can see one here, another one over there. And so what are the key challenges here? So in fact, the key thing is to design sampling models <clears throat> um, which specify how much information is needed to faithfully reconstruct the shape. For example, if we were looking at this uh, point cloud of size 10 here, um, the question would be, OK, should we output, in fact, two polygons? one closed, one open, or should we output a single polygon? And in fact, as you can see here, this is an in post problem because we don't have enough information in order to conclude, right? And so again, what we wish to do is to design sampling models uh, allowing to understand the connection between or understand, allow one to infer sufficient conditions to faithfully reconstruct the shapes, okay? So this is one challenge. And another one, although uh, the reconstruction of surfaces is pretty now, is well understood by now, uh, in particular, a surge of work has been developed after this seminal paper by Nina Menta and Marshall Byrne uh, more than 10 years back. So one key question, which is pretty much still open, is to handle shapes which are non-manifold. For example, if I give you a point cloud sample on a mixture here, so we have a curve, we have two surfaces, we could possibly have points filling a 3D volume. So reconstructing this mixture of manifolds is in fact uh, pretty much open. So I'll give you some ideas on how to handle that. So <clears throat> another problem, which is not reconstruction, but uh, which is somehow, somehow similar, is handling fuzzy shapes. So one example I'm particularly interested in is handling uh, molecules. So if we are talking about a system th like this one, it's a molecule which can flex. And uh, if, we, if we were to average uh, all the conformation of the molecules, and if we were doing so, so as to compute the probability density map in such a way that for each point in space, we would have the probability to have this point covered by a random conformation of the molecule. So for this example, we would end up with such a map. And as you can see, we have high confidence regions. In the middle, we are pretty sure that the points are gonna be covered by a random conformation. 
but we also have loci of points where the probability is much lower. Okay, so these are uh, real examples of so-called probability density maps, which are associated by to the so-called nuclear power complex, and so these are uh, probability densities associated to specific specific proteins, well, NUP 170, POM 152, within a much bigger system called an NPC. So these are pictures from data released with a couple of papers published in Nature five years back. Here is another example. So if we are looking at this point cloud, you are likely to say, if I were, if I was asking the question, how many clusters are there, you would likely tell me two, right? Why, why is that? Because in fact, well, if you were to perform a density estimation from the point cloud, in fact, you would have, well, two, mountain, two mountains separated by a valley, right? And so what I'll be talking about is in fact one way to somehow disentangle the peaks associated to, in fact, such a landscape, I would say, or such a terrain. And so the challenges here are, if we're talking about noisy data, molecules for point clouds, so there are several issues. One of them is, how can one define relevant features which are noise resilient, of course? How can one assess the stability of the features? And also, more generally, how can one build abstract models? Because, of course, if we are talking about complex data, uh, developing models is one way to, to get insights on the phenomena under scrutiny. Another problem I won't be discussing in detail, uh, I won't have time, I guess, is about um, landscape analysis. So, um, in fact, what we call a landscape is a, it, it is a, a terrain, right? I give you a function defined over a high dimensional space. So this would be typically a Euclidean space, but it could be a metric space too. And to each point, I, I associate a value, the fitness the, of the function, the value of the function. And the key problem typically is to learn the topography of the mountain, right? Which is defined above this high dimensional space. And so the simplest question one can ask is the following, what is a significant peak? It's like when one is looking at the mountain range from uh, the mountain range. So if we, one is located far away, so one just sees the prominent peaks, but by moving closer, one starts to see secondary peaks, right? Okay, and so the, here one has some examples of classical functions which are being used as a test bed in op non-convex optimization. And so what we want to do again is to, well, to understand such landscapes just from samples drawn on the landscape. Okay, so I talked about the significant peaks, but more generally, we'll be talking about critical points of the function. Okay, so we generalize the local minima and maxima. <clears throat> and also, we'll be talking about the watersheds associated to uh, the critical points, which mathematically are the so called critical, stable, and unstable manifolds of the function being studied. Okay, so this is just to give you some motivation. So now some mathematical back background, and I'll be discussing some, I, th I believe, important topics uh, which are found in many areas of mathematics and algorithms. <clears throat> so one key feature uh, is in fact homology, or homology, homological information. So homology is in fact quite a technical topic. It's defined in terms of quotient vector spaces, and so I'm not going to dis discuss the mathematics. I'll just try to convey the key ideas. So if one is given a shape, uh, studying the homology essentially means counting k cycles which do not bound regardless of their thic thickness. So we are going to take a few examples and hopefully this will convey the message. So if we are looking at this ring here, the gray one, which is made of six triangles, okay, let's look at the inner triangle. So in fact, so this is a one cycle, k equals to one, and this cycle does not bound because there is a void in the middle. Okay. So in fact, this cycle scores one in the order one homology. If we're looking at this outer cycle, so this outer cycle, in fact, also bounds a void, the same one in the middle. But in fact, these two cycles are called homologous. They are equivalent because, as I said, we don't care about the thickness of what's in between. And in fact, <clears throat> when one looks into the mathematics, we can move from one cycle to the other by adding the boundary of the six triangles. Okay. So this is exactly what homology is about, counting cycles which do not bound regardless of the thickness. So if we look at this uh, red cycle here, as you can see, this cycle bounds. In fact, it bounds the union of the two triangles. So this cycle does not count in the order one homology. And of course, k, can, k equals to zero, k equals to one, k equals to two, so we can study homological information of any order. Here is another example. If we look at, uh, well, an inner tube, from your bicycle. 
So in fact, there are two cycles which do not bound. So there's a small circle here and any cycle which will revolve around the void of the torus here. Okay, but now if you pick any other cycle, such as this one, in fact, such a cycle is bounding a region which is found on the surface of the torus. So in this case, the number of independent cycles which do not bound is equal to two, right? So <clears throat> in general, one concise way to assess the homology is in terms of Betty numbers, which is the cardinality of the number of cycles which do not bound. So beta zero, this is the number of connected components, beta one, the number of tunnels, beta two, the number of voids, so this is a small example I give as an exercise to my students. So you play with Legos. We build incrementally a shape, and we can count the number of com components, voids, tunnels, and voids. So for example, okay, I keep adding um, transparent Legos. So upon adding this one, as you can see, I create a tunnel, right? With your car, you could, in fact, enter the tunnel here and uh, go be below, right? If I keep adding these uh, other Legos, I, I have the same tunnel, which I have extended somehow, right? So here, beta 1 equals to 1, beta 1 equals to 1 here. If I keep adding Legos on the other side, so now beta, two, beta 1 equals to 2 because I have two independent tunnels. But look, if I, if I was adding another transparent Lego here, so then I would merge the two tunnels, right? So beta 1 would switch back to 1. And upon adding the last Lego here, beta 1, thing, in fact, remains 1. I have a tunnel. But now this tunnel is also coupled to a void because within the wall shape, I have created a volume. Okay, so this is in fact homology, and a very important concept is persistent homology. So in persistent homology, if one is creating, let's say, a cell complex, a simplicial complex, a CW complex by incrementally adding pieces, in fact, <clears throat> uh, as, you can, as we have just discussed on the example, at some point a tunnel appears, later on we shall destroy this tunnel, and the homology, the persistence of some homological feature is in fact its lifetime during the wall construction of the complex. Something which is very important too is Morse theory. So in Morse theory, in fact, one is given a domain, uh, typically a manifold, <clears throat> together with a, a function defined on the manifold. So here is a very simple example. If I give you a torus, uh, this is the upright torus. It's a very simple, the simplest way to define a function is to assign, okay, I put it onto a table and I just measure the height with respect to the table. So this is a height function. To each point on the surface, I assign its height. So it's a function defined on a manifold, the height function. Okay, <clears throat> I can also define a, a height function defined on a 3D domain, right? For example, if I define any polynomial over defined over a bounded domain of R3 is a height function defined over a three-dimensional domain. Here is one example, here. Okay, if I give you a set of objects, if I look at the distance function to the objects, so this is gonna define another, another function with respect to the ambient space containing the objects. And so in more theory, one is interested in learning the topology of the manifold from the variation of the function which we look into. And in particular, one is uh, tracking the variation of the topology of the sub-level sets of the function, the loci of points such that the function takes a value less than a threshold. For example, back to the stories here, if we are uh, in the, torus, the upright torus is on a table, so we piece, uh, take a piece of paper, and so we are going to sweep the torus starting from the table all the way to the tip of the torus. And as you can see, the topology of what of the sub-level sets is going to evolve over time. So in between the minimum and this saddle point here, so the topology, we have essentially the topology of the sub-level set is a cup, right? So we have like a, a ball, a cup. But as you can see, upon hitting the saddle, index one saddle, so we have created order one homology, indeed. Uh, if we are looking at the topology of the shape discovered up to a height which is larger than the height of the critical point, so now, um, in fact, we have created a cycle in homological terms, right? We have a cycle which does not bound. And so as you can see, it can be proved that the topology of the sub-level sets changes upon passing critical points only. So here is another example, uh, back to this polynomial function, so if I'm looking at the, if I'm trying to solve the equation, well, minus uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to uh, minus epsilon. So I will get, in fact, two connected components. So it's a two-sheeted hyperboloid. So now, uh, what about the level set, the, the geometry of the level set surface uh, at a threshold plus epsilon, namely above the critical value associated to the critical point? which is zero here. If you take the gradient of this polynomial, of course, it vanishes at zero only. So the, the only critical point is zero, zero, zero. 
the critical height associated, the critical value is zero. And so the topology of the sub-level set above the critical value is now a surface, a connected surface. And so as you can see, the topology has evolved from two connected components to one. And so this is in fact because we have merged them as a critical point. And so in fact, in more theory, this can be um, made uh, precise in terms of so-called stable manifolds of a critical point. So in fact, when one is given a critical point on a, on a manifold, uh, if we look at the gradient vector field of the function of the manifold, we can define the so-called stable manifolds, namely the loci of points which flow to the critical point when uh, following the integral curves. So this is more theory. Again, uh, learning the topology of a manifold from uh, the variation of a function defined on that manifold. So the last piece of information as a, I want to give as a background is about Voronoi diagrams. So Voronoi diagrams, everybody has seen them. So this is, a, of course, is a jira. This is the back of a turtle. This is a, a, a leaf. And here we have magnifying the leaf. This is dry mud. These are uh, stones. Uh, I think it's called the Giant's Hallway. This is found in Northern Ireland. Ireland, Ireland, Ireland. And as you can see here, we have very specific patterns. In fact, we have these cells of course, which um, look convex pretty much if we were to idealize them. And in fact, Voronoi diagrams are coupled to growth processes. Because if you think about uh, maybe two cells uh, growing, OK, let's, let's put a point here, a point there. If um, we were, we were uh, observing a growth process at the same, operating at the same speed from the two centers, in fact, the growing balls would meet uh, on the bisector of the line segment joining the centers, and that would be the boundary of the Voronoi cell. And so, of course, uh, Voronoi diagrams can be made more general by looking at distance or, or distance function more elaborate than just the Euclidean distance to two points. Okay? <clears throat> to make things a bit more precise and to bridge the gap to more theory. So here is what's going on. So the simplest, this is, in fact, the simplest Voronoi diagram one can think of. We have two points, three points. In fact, the Voronoi diagram is the low side of points which are equidistant from at least two such points. OK. OK, so we have, in fact, in the Voronoi diagram, Voronoi edges. OK, we have the Voronoi center. Any point on an edge is equidistant from two points. And we also have here this Voronoi center, which is equidistant from, in fact, not two, but three points, x1, x2, x3. And there is, in fact, a dual structure known as the Dillon triangulation, where whenever we have two uh, points uh, associated to a Voronoi edge, we dump, in fact, the one simplex, namely the edge connecting these two points. Whenever we have a point in the Voronoi diagram equidistant from three points, x1, x2, x3 here, we dump into the Dillon triangulation the triangle, which is a convex cell of the three points. And this is defining, in fact, a simplicial complex known as the Dillon triangulation. Now, there is a refinement of the Dillon triangulation. In fact, if we are back to this growth process, and if we start growing balls centered on the points, what we see here, in fact, if we compute what we call the restrictions, namely the intersection of a ball with its boundary region, what you see here in green, and if we now track the intersection between restrictions, as you can see at this stage, the restriction of the ball center at x1 intersect this one here. And in that case, we are going to dump this edge. Okay? The same, likewise, we have an intersection between two restrictions here. We dump this edge. Okay? And as you can see here, we have, in fact, one connected component. But in terms of homology, we don't have any cycle. Now, if we proceed along the growth process, these two balls, the top one, centered at x1 and x2, are going to intersect. And then we'll be dumping this edge into the alpha complex. And by then, in terms of homological terms, observe that we have created a cycle. So in fact, this is a constructive version of more theory. Namely, one can track the evolution of the topology of the sub-level sub set of fun function, here the distant function to the samples, by constructing, in fact, this simplicial complex known as the alpha complex. So this is a very important thing. So I have a, a small movie here, which we can look at. <clears throat> So again, we are we want to again we want to track the evolution of the topology of the sub-level sets of the distance function, and by tracking intersection between restrictions. And as you can see here, these two balls just intersected. We have created this edge. These two balls intersected. We have created this edge. And so if we proceed, we are going to create a more and more elaborate simplicial complex, which eventually is going to match the Delaunay triangulation of the void point cloud. Okay. So again. By running this growth process, 
we can track the evolution of the topology thanks to a very simple construction, which is just made of simplices. OK, I briefly mentioned that uh, there were many complex Voronoi diagrams. So here is a small zoo. So here, this is a power diagram, which is, in fact, the most general affine Voronoi diagram. Namely, all the bisectors here are flats, right? Planes in 3D. Here, it's known as a Mobius diagram. So we are looking at a, not the distance, a, a more general distance function. And in fact, uh, which is this one. So we, we have a multiplicative parameter with, this, with respect to the center of a ball plus an additive parameter. And now it turns out that the bisectors are hyperspheres. Here is, uh, here is a Voronoi diagram where we look into, in fact, the, the Euclidean distance to the center minus an additive parameter. So this is a so-called Apollonius diagram whose bisectors are, in fact, uh, degree two algebraic surfaces, in fact, um, uh, hyperbola and hyperboloid in 3D. And this is an even more complicated Voronoi diagram where we have a multiplicative parameter with respect to the Euclidean distance to the center and also an additive parameter. And so this one is even more complex because the bisectors are degree four algebraic surfaces. And so I'll show you later on how one can model fuzzy data using, for example, this Voronoi diagram. But the point here is that Voronoi diagrams exist in a number of guises, right? OK. Equipped with this background, I want to discuss two applications. So the first one is about the reconstruction of compact sets. And so again, I give you a point cloud sample on a mixture of manifolds, and I would like to reconstruct them. So <clears throat> in fact, so this falls in the realm of more theory. So again, we are going to try to, to, to understand what's going on in terms of critical points, distances, stable and unstable manifolds, which are words I already mentioned. So <clears throat> again, so we are looking at the point cloud. So here we have po four points from P0 to P3. OK, and the function which we define over the wall space is, in fact, the minimum Euclidean distance to, the point, to, 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 to these four points. OK, and so now we can, let's try to ask ourselves, what are the minima of the distance function? What are the maxima? And do we have any saddle points? So obviously, the minima are the samples themselves because the function is 0, right? If you look into the geometry, if we look, for example, at this uh, Voronoi vertex here, it's not very difficult to convince oneself that if you are sitting here, you won't be able to increase the function in any way, right? Because in fact, you are equidistant from, in fact, P0, P1, and P3. So this is gonna be a local maximum. And now, interestingly, we have these green bullets here, which has index one saddles. Why is it so? If you have studied uh, dynamical systems, you know what uh, a saddle is, right? Typically, in prey-predator systems, an index one saddle is a, is a point where, if you look at the integral curves, you have two of them which are flowing into the critical point and two of them which are flowing out. And so this is exactly what's going on. So <clears throat> in fact, here, um, so if, you, if you look, if you are along this edge, P0 to P3, if you move from P0 to sigma 1, so the function increases, right? But once you have hit sigma 1, so now there is an ambiguity. How can you increase the value of the function? And as you can see, you can move upward or, or downward. So whenever there is an ambiguity, so this is going to be a critical point. OK, so this is it. OK, and now, OK, so we have minima, maxima, saddles. And more generally, if I pick any point, I can construct, like in the, for the classical dynamical system, the orbit of a point, which is going to tell me how the point evolves if I'm following, in fact, the integral curve associated to the gradient of the function. For example, if I'm sitting here, if I want to increase my function, I'm going to go all the way to infinity. If I'm sitting at x1, in fact, to increase the function, in fact, at x1, I am in the Voronoi region of P0, and so my nearest neighbor is P0, and to increase the function, I will move away from P0 until the moment when I hit x2. When I am sitting at x2, I, I am on the Voronoi edge, which is associated to P0, P1. And so if I want to increase the value of my function, I, want, I have to move away from P, P0 and P1, right? and so on and so forth. So these are the float trajectories, or so-called orbits, of the distant function. And so now, in terms of more theory, one can ask uh, himself, so what are the so-called stable and unstable manifolds associated to a critical point? So I have pretty much discussed this example. What are the points which are flowing to sigma 0? In fact, here, so these are all the points located on the edge P2, P3. Once I have, I have hit uh, sigma 0, what are the points which are flowing away from sigma 0? So in fact, this is this Voronoi edge. 
Okay? So <clears throat> the horizontal line segment is called the stable manifold of sigma zero. The vertical line segment, which is, um, uh, in fact, it's, it's a ray, in fact, because it's bounded here, but not below. So this is going to be the unstable manifold of uh, sigma zero. So we can also look into the stable manifold of an index two critical point, namely a local maximum. As you can see here, this is a very simple case. Any point located in the triangle is going to flow to this maximum if I'm following the orbit of the gradient vector field of the distance function. Okay. And very interestingly, if one is able to construct these stable manifolds, there is a concise representation in terms of has a diagram, namely, um, uh, we have a partial order here, which tells, which tells us the following. If I'm starting from P0 here, uh, if I'm following the flow, I'm, I may end up in sigma 1 or sigma 3, okay? And now if I'm following the unstable manifold of sigma 3, I'm going to go to the, max, to the finite maximum, this one, or I'm going to flow to infinity, right? From sigma, sigma 3, I may end up in the finite maximum, or I may flow all the way to infinity. And so this is a very concise representation encoding adjacencies between critical points. Okay, so now, in a nutshell, I'm going to give you one way to reconstruct very complex shapes in terms of mixtures of manifolds using this machinery. So the idea, well, what, the basic idea uh, is, uh, was developed by colleagues in this paper published at SOCG in 2005. Let's take a look to this image. So what one sees here are the so-called stable manifolds of index two critical points, okay? <clears throat> and in fact, of course, if you are given a point cloud on this triple torus, you, you, you see visually that it's a triple torus. So the question is, how can I mathematically define a piecewise complex, which is indeed a triple torus? And now, if we paint, in fact, the stable manifold uh, with two colors, namely the stable manifold corresponding to critical points with a small value, a small critical value on the one hand, and the stable manifolds associated to critical points with a large critical value, as you can see, they are well separated. In other words, if I'm looking at this uh, has a diagram encoding critical points, I have a gap. There is a big gap between the critical values associated to the surface and the critical value there will be about the magnitude of the sampling, right? And the remaining critical points are going to be in the middle of the shape, essentially. Okay. And so here what has been done in this paper is a tagging of critical points as surface critical point or medial axis critical points based on an estimate of the normals to the surface. Okay. But now if we are talking about a much complex shape, much more complex shape, let's see, let's say uh, a mixture of manifolds, we cannot rely upon the notion of normal, no, because the normal to the surface may not exist, in particular if we have intersection. And so we have uh, developed new, new machinery to do that. So uh, in a nutshell, how does it work? So this is a greedy reconstruction algorithm which works as, follow, as follows. So again, we are going to exploit the separation between the critical points, those associated to the shape and those associated to the complement of the shape. And so let's assume that, okay, if we look into this picture here, so the yellow points, these are index one critical points. So the orange points are index two critical points. And we also have red points which are associated to index three critical points, namely maxima of the distance function to the samples in 3D, okay? And let's assume that we, we have included, in fact, this edge here into the reconstruction. So again, what we have included is, in fact, the stable manifold of an index one critical point. But again, because we have this has a diagram encoding connectivity between critical points, well, uh, if we have included this edge, we can make two extensions. We can say, okay, because, in fact, the distance between this point and the index one is pretty much the same as the distance between this point and the index two, if we have this guy, we must include this one, okay? Okay, but now, so, and this is what's going to happen. So typically, uh, these are gonna be, if we have this table manifold in the reconstruction, we, we, we insert this one because the critical values are pretty much the same. If we take the ratio of the two critical values, in fact, we'll have a, something almost one. Now, if we look at this table manifold, this polygon here, which is a stable manifold associated to this index two critical point. Well, now if we look at the, the in fact, the critical value associated to this one, let's say, let's call this one unit, right? And if we compare it to this distance, which would be maybe five units, so this is much bigger, right? And so this would be a giant step. And so in other words, if we have this one, obviously we want, if we have the line segment, we also, we obviously want this triangle because essentially um, the distance are the same but we probably don't want this one 
because this is giant step. And so this is what our algorithm is doing. It is, in fact, so now it's more complicated. What I've just discussed is the so-called upflow extension. But we also have a regularization step to maintain, uh, in fact, um, a cell complex. And there is also an, another horizontal extension. But essentially, this is the key idea. So we are going to walk in this um, diagram here. We are going to find cuts. And the reconstruction will be, in fact, the union of the stable manifolds associated to the critical points selected before the gap. OK. So does it work? In fact, yes, uh, very well. And so I'm just going to give you two uh, good incentives to, to, well, to promote this method. One of them is, um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, as I told you, we want to reconstruct non-manifold shapes. And so here, this, this is two, two balls intersecting. And in fact, if we look into the intersection, uh, we would expect a circle arc. But what we are reconstructing is, in fact, something which has the right homotopy type. Namely, we, we, we may end up with a stretch, stretch version of the circle arc, but the reconstruction is correct, in fact. It's just that um, at some point, because the sampling in, at the intersection between the two spheres is not sufficient, we, have, uh, not, we don't have just line segments, we, but we also may have, in fact, polygons, which are uh, stretch, stretch versions of the line segments. A very interesting feature also is the following one. Let's, let's assume that we, a very simple example, you have a car, a mock-up of a car, and let's assume that your laser scanner has scanned a curve on the top of the car. So then if I ask you what is the shape, you may say, okay, this is the top of the car, but someone else may say, oh, hold on a second, before seeing the whole car, I see a curve which has been drawn on the car, right? So in other words, if we are looking at a point cloud, it could be the case that there is not a unique satisfactory reconstruction. Indeed, one may have uh, shapes which are visible at multiple scales. And this is back to the example we looked into previously. So if we are running the reconstruction here by thresholding the ratio between incident critical values, so someone may say, this is a hole. Why is it so? Because in fact, as you can see, the distance to the middle of the hole compared to, in fact, the length of the line segments bounding the holes is too large. But someone else may say, no, for my application, this is not a hole. Right? And so what, we are, what is embedded in our reconstruction is the ability to report not just a reconstruction, but a set, a family of plausible reconstructions. And one is just monitoring this family by using this parameter, which is measuring the ratio of, in fact, critical values. So there is a, I briefly mentioned the persistent thing, right, which is about measuring the lifetime of homological features. So we have a version of this in here. So in fact, let me, uh, to move on, let me briefly discuss this briefly. So as you can see, so here we have two acute triangles, OK? But if I'm moving P1 slightly, look at what's going on. P1 is getting obtuse, OK? So on this figure, here I have two critical points. Because this triangle, the top triangle is acute, I have a maximum here, and I have an index one saddle here. But if I slightly perturb P1, this triangle is getting obtuse, and now the two critical points, in fact, vanish. They disappear. So up to a tiny perturbation of the coordinates of the points, so I have canceled two critical points. Okay. And so, of course, if, if you have data with such a phenomenon, so you have something which is not stable. And of course, this is not very good. And so mathematically, we have a way to get rid of this topological noise. And so this is, in fact, an idea which was used um, by Steven Smale in his proof of the Poincaré conjecture, for which he was awarded the Fields Medal. And in fact, so what we are doing, in fact, we are, looking, uh, we are looking into the incidence of critical points, and we are reverting the flow of the, of the gradient. And basically, uh, virtually speaking, we are able to get rid of uh, topological noise without actually changing the geometry. So prosaically speaking, <clears throat> if you look into a mountain like this, of course, this is what I was saying. If you are uh, pretty close, you may say, OK, this local minimum is not significant because if I, step, uh, if I make one step upward, I'm on, on a local maximum, right? And so virtually speaking, what you could do is to push the local minimum upward, to push the local maximum downward. And this way, you would, you would end up with, in fact, this terrain, which does not have any more critical points, OK? Th this can be done. This operation, in fact, can be done by looking at the diagram which is encoding incidences between, between critical points. And so we do so for the reconstruction so as to widen the gaps between, in fact, 
the stable manifolds which define the reconstruction and the other ones. And so there are situations which where the, reconstru where the reconstruction is not satisfactory, such as this one. But if you run one or two steps of persistence, then you widen the gap and then you are able to recover what you expect. So this is a fundamental operation, in fact. So there are a couple of theorems associated to the reconstruction, which are pretty technical, and so I will skip them. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, the second topic I want to discuss briefly is, in fact, about modeling through fuzzy shapes. So I mentioned this uh, clustering issue here. You have two clusters. Well, they have been painted in red and blue. So this is what you would expect. Th there is this business about molecules, too. And so here is a very simple idea to accommodate fuzzy shapes. So in fact, let's take for granted so-called probability density maps, where we have high confidence regions on the one hand and low confidence regions. And so the question is, how can we accommodate these two uh, types of regions? So one simple idea is the following. So we are going to, we'll be using what we call tolerance balls, and so as to define tolerance models. So <clears throat> in fact, we are going to work with pairs of concentric balls. So the inner ball here is going to be meant to accommodate the high confidence regions. The outer ball here is going to be meant in such a way, is going to be defined in such a way that the region between the inner ball and the outer ball defines the loci of points where something interesting may happen. Okay? And of course, if we have inner ball and outer balls, we can define by interpolation of the radii, we can define any ball of intermediate radius. Right? If lambda equals to zero, we have the inner ball. Okay? Lambda equals to zero, ri minus, we have the inner ball. Lambda equals to one, we have the outer ball. Okay? And in between, we can interpolate. In fact, we can also extrapolate so as to go within the inner ball and outside the outer ball. So the interesting thing is that, as I said, uh, when you're running a growth process, now if you consider a family of pairs of concentric balls, so, and if you interpolate the radii for any pair of, associated to any pair of concentric balls, it's like defining a Voronoi diagram. And in fact, so um, balls are going to grow and they will meet along the, their bisectors except in that here the bisectors are algebraic surfaces. Interestingly, if you're looking at the Voronoi regions, they are neither connected nor simply connected. So for example, if we look at the Voronoi region associated to, so this Voronoi region here, this line segment and this one, so this is a, a Voronoi region associated to two balls, the loci of points equidistant from two balls according to th this general generalized distance, and as you can see, it is not connected, obviously. If we look, into the Vronor region of uh, this, uh, this orange Vronor region, as you can see, it is not simply connected because we have two holes, okay? And so, of course, this is a complex Vronor diagram, and we encode it in using an, uh, an abstract simplicial complex, namely a simplicial complex we cannot be, which cannot be embedded uh, in 2D or 3D as the usual Dillon triangulation. But if you remember, uh, I've shown you this little demo about the alpha complex. When bolts are, in fact, growing, we are computing restrictions, and we are, um, in fact, dumping edges, which are encoding the topology along the growth process. And here we can do the same. So we have generalized, in fact, the alpha complex in the context of this Voronoi diagram. And thanks to that, one can track, in fact, the evolution of the homological information along the growth process. So how can this be used? So now I'm playing with, uh, in fact, a molecule, but I'm sure this can be, uh, this game can also be played in a variety of contexts. So this is a simple molecular machine involving three molecules, two orange and a blue one. And because we have uncertainties, we'll be running this growth process, which I just defined by interpolating the radii. And in fact, uh, as you can see, so the first event which will occur here is an intersection between this orange molecule and the blue one. And so the second event, and so when this is occurring, he, in fact, so we start from three isolated molecules, P1, P2, P3. So the first event, again, is this collision, and by then, P1 and P2 are merging. And so, in fact, we have this graph node here, which is encoding the collision between P1 and P2. So later on, the blue molecule and the second orange one are merging, and so we have this graph node here, which is encoding the collision between P2 and P3. So in other words, we can build here, um, um, again, a Hasser diagram, in such a way that each node is associated a graph which is encoding the pairwise contacts. Okay. And now I told you about um, topological persistence. We have an interesting assessment. Uh, if you have random points or random mo uh, molecules within your protein complex, 
So these collisions may occur randomly, right? Okay. But if you see that if you have two very isolated components, so you'll see collisions on the right hand side, collision on the left hand side, and then you won't see any collision during a, a long amount of time, right? And so, um, in fact, uh, if we are looking at the vertical axis here, we can measure. So for every complex here, for every node, every node comes or uh, we have a, a, a birth date for every node which corresponds to the merge of two complexes and we have a death date which is a moment in time when in fact the complex merges with another one. And so the discrepancy between the birth date and the death date is an assessment of the stability of the thing we are looking at. Right? So this is back to the, to the idea of topological persistence. If things are evolving, in fact the lifetime of a mathematical object is an assessment of its stability. So I have a small demo here too to show you how this is working for a real protein complex. So I won't be discussing the details, but this is in fact a, a piece of work which has been developed in uh, Andre Sally lab where uh, Daniel uh, was last year. And um, in fact, so there we have uh, 30 different colors corresponding to protein species for a total of uh, 500, almost 500 different proteins. And so what we'll be looking into is in fact this merge process involving by tracking in fact merges between all the proteins of in fact seven types or seven colors if you wish and you are going to see what's going on so these are we we saw briefly the inner balls so these are the outer balls so now we'll see all the outer balls of all the proteins of seven types so okay inner balls of all the proteins of the seven types Okay, and now we are going to run this growth process. And in running the growth process, we are going to see merges, right, between proteins. Okay, so it should come. So lambda is increasing from lambda equals to zero all the way to lambda equals to one. And in fact, so we observe merges from which we in, in fact infer uh, interesting information in terms of protein complexes involving specific protein types. And of course, this has to be put back in biological context to, to make sense, but in fact, it does. Okay, so this was a demo about, uh, in fact, running this growth process for a complex biological system. I'm, I, I'm not going to discuss the biology, but I just want to give you one particular application. Let's assume that you have a, such a complex fuzzy shape on the one hand, and let's assume that you have a, a local a high resolution model, if I may say, on the other hand. So again, when we are growing this, uh, when we are running this growth process, graphs, in fact, collisions occur, and whenever two collisions occur, we define a graph. On the other hand, you may have, for specific proteins here, you may have a graph uh, which is a ground truth, because possibly some biologists have worked out, in fact, this particular part of the system at high resolution. And so, if you want to probe your global model, which is fuzzy, against high-resolution local information, uh, in fact, you will have to compare two graphs. Okay? And uh, in doing so, it's like comparing two shapes. You have the common information, and, and then you have the symmetric difference, namely edges which are found in this graph, but on, not on the right-hand side, and vice versa. And so these operations are, in fact, computing the intersection between two graphs, these are called as, well, what you want to do is to find the so-called maximum common induced subgraphs or maximum common edge subgraphs. And so interestingly, so this is a piece of work I done with uh, Chidmai Karande who's sitting here a few years back. And so again, the punchline here is that if you have a fuzzy model on the one hand, and if you want to probe it against local high level or highly detailed information on the other hand, you can reduce this operation to the comparison of graphs which hopefully are not too large, otherwise the computation of MCIS and MCES would not go through. Okay, and so we have applications in biology, but I'm not going to, to discuss this. Okay, so I put here a few papers. So, so this one is in fact about, if you want to, to learn about all this framework, which is coupling uh, more theory, persistent theory, Voronoi diagrams. So these are just um, papers you can start from. So this, the first one is about computing uh, in fact, the flow complex, uh, which is um, the stable manifolds of the distance function associated with the point cloud. So this is joint work with uh, Sylvain Pio, who's sitting here. So this is a paper about the reconstruction of compact sets. And then we have this uh, complex Voronoi diagram associated to 
um, in fact, pairs of concentric balls, and then applications. One question you may ask is, how is it difficult? How is it, is it difficult to compute these tolerance models? In fact, it is because these are coupled to geometric versions of max k cover, which is a NP-complete problem. And so this is indeed difficult, but one can work out approximation algorithms. OK. And so to conclude, in fact, uh, the point in this talk was to, in fact, uh, brought through a uh, framework which is coupling somehow uh, more theory, because we are um, uh, defining functions over a manifold. Uh, and then more theory, because we are tracking the evolution of the level sets and uh, uh, to qualify the topology. And then stability analysis, thanks to a more theoretical version of um, topological persistence. So even though the application themselves may seem pretty different, the reconstruction of models, the analysis of fuzzy molecules, or the analysis of land shapes in high dimensional spaces, in fact, it is highly coherent. And so to conclude, I would say that <clears throat> Uh, from a theoretical standpoint, what we are doing, we are, since we want to deal with complex shapes plagued with noise, in fact, I think uh, one uh, resorting to multi-scale analysis is instrumental to build noise resident models because, in fact, we are not dealing with one shape but with a continuum of shapes, right? And again, we are tracking stable features uh, within this continuum. So Vronoi diagrams, so we have seen a few of them. I think it's a very versatile framework because uh, this provides you or it, al it allows people to, to build an algorithmic version of more theory. More theory is classically, has been classically developed in differential topology, but there is no way in the most general setting one can compute these stable and unstable manifolds. So with Vronoi diagrams, in fact, one has a quantitative version of uh, more theory. And so it's, in fact, uh, very important. And of course, stability analysis, uh, which aims at spotting stable features. So this is reminiscent from singularity theory in mathematics, where, in fact, the stable features, the, the unstable transitions, uh, structure, uh, in fact, um, events, and define uh, uh, delimit, define stable features. And so persistent theory is doing this, but again, in an al algorithmic way. And so practically speaking, I think this framework can be used in a number of settings because geometric data analysis is ubiquitous. And most importantly, I think this, sh this should be instrumental to develop a virtual, a virtual loop uh, in between model design and mo model analysis, right? Because if we're talking about complex data, we want to, uh, which we want to analyze, if the information which is delivered upon completing the analysis is too complex, et cetera, well, there are two things. Either the model is not the right one or the data are not complete enough, right? And so all these machinery is hinting, in fact, uh, at two things, either simplifying the model or acquiring new data. Thank you. Uh, if the audience has any question, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, don't mention any confidential information. Maybe I have one, one question. Um, so you do a lot of software development uh, in your research. Can you tell us a, a bit more about uh, how you handle this? Uh, what software do you use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> of course all this, um, all the software which is developed here is um, challenging for two reasons. One of them is the numerical issues. And so of course Sylvain Pion himself is a specialist of these issues because uh, as you know, geometric software development requires, if you want a program to, to remain consistent, you have to make the right decision, go on the right-hand side or the left-hand side when this is required. And so what we are using here, uh, working in your steps, is somehow we are using a mix of interval arithmetic and exact calculations to, in fact, ensure that the predicates and the constructions are reliable. Okay. And so in other words, what we are doing, we develop in Seagull style, although we did not push all the packages within Seagull, so as to guarantee that the computations are correct. So yeah, so as a working tool library, we are using Seagull, OK? And now, of course, we have more um, dedicated applications to, uh, well, the for the reconstruction of non-manifold surfaces for the analysis of molecular models and um, also for the analysis of high-dimensional terrains. And so these are 
typically packages which we make available to the community in binary form because we want people to probe them before putting the effort into the development of an open source platform. Yeah, if you have a nice sample grid, then there are some very straightforward things that you can do sort of with prior knowledge of, of, of what your epsilons are. Um, whereas if, you, if you've got uh, random clouds of samples to reconstruct from, um, then you end up doing a lot more mathematics um, and you, you lose a lot of efficiency. So I, I wonder if you have anything to say about this, about this trade-off. There's a third case that comes up in your last line there of, of actually refining um, the, the, the data uh, adaptively. Speaking to this mic, yeah. Yeah, so I think there are two things which are going on concomitantly here, right? Um, there is algorithm development, but also what we want to do is to understand when things are going to work and when they are going to fail, right? And somehow, <clears throat> I think, well, using a grid or using a point cloud, so the issues are pretty much equivalent, right? So if we're talking about people, for example, into medical image processing, if you want to, if, if you want to segment a CT scan so as to recover the arteries near the heart, etc., the question, there are stenosis in, the, uh, there is some stenosis within an artery. The question is, uh, is the width uh, big enough in order for my algorithm to reconstruct the pipe? Or is it going to break and to, 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 disconnect, to disconnect them? So <clears throat> I would say that <clears throat> if you really want to understand what's going on, <clears throat> eventually it will boil down to the same questions. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a grid, so of course you have, um, there is information which is uh, available uh, at a low cost probably, right? Because you have, of course, you know where your neighbors are sitting, etc. If you have, um, if you're, you're, you're talking about a point cloud, the sampling, if the sampling is uneven, so of course it's, it's getting more difficult. So, yeah, this is what I would say. Questions on the VC, maybe? Okay, so let's thank Frederick again, and uh, yeah, thank you.